Welcome to the Trailblazers Impact Podcast, a groundbreaking new podcast that explores the transformative journeys of contemporary female history makers, from the civil rights era in the 1960s to overcoming LGBTQ discrimination, gender bias, and racial discrimination in today's world. I'm Nan McKay, and Dee Dee Strum and I interview women and a few men to bring you the aspirational stories of fearless women entrepreneurs, authors, attorneys, executives, community leaders, and mothers who have blazed a trail for others to follow. Get your dose of can-do empowerment today. Trailblazers Impact Podcast is featured in the top 20 Trailblazers Trendsetters Podcast by Feedspot and is one of the top 28 podcasts for women in their 20s by Pretty Progressive. Visit our website, trailblazersimpact.com, and listen to all three of our podcasts. Subscribe using the link on our website to receive our newsletter with featured podcasts. Love what you hear? then please share our episodes on your social media sites and shop for all your Amazon needs through the link on our website, trailblazersimpact.com, to help support the podcast. Good morning and welcome to Trailblazers Impact, a podcast program where we thrive on capturing, sharing, and archiving for posterity the stories of contemporary women who, much like Harriet Tubman, carved out a new path for themselves and the girls to follow. Today I have with me the national president of the National Coalition of 100 Black Women Incorporated, Ms. Virginia W. Harris. I am so pleased to be able to do this interview in the month of March, because March is, as we know, Women's History Month. And this year, the theme for Women's History Month is Valiant Women of the Vote. This theme honors the brave women who fought to win suffrage rights for women and for the women who continue to fight for the voting rights of others. How perfect this is for a woman like Virginia W. Harris, who leads a nationwide advocacy organization by, for, and about women. And they too have adopted a theme this year that's consistent with women and others' right to vote. So with that opening, Virginia, good morning. And would you share a little bit with us about first, where you grew up, and what influences do you think there were in your childhood that made you such a lifelong giver, a woman who has always been involved with civic engagement, activism in one form or another? Good morning, Dee. I am delighted to have the opportunity to share some experience, personal experience, but more importantly, experience about my advocacy work with the National Coalition of 100 Black Women. My family background consists of military, family members, ministers, and educators. My father was a military man, my mother an educator, and today she is still 92 years young. I have sisters and I am the middle child of girls. I grew up with only sisters. My mother taught us that it was more important to be smart than feminine. And I'm sure that a lot of people may not understand that, but she thought that being feminine was a sign of weaknesses. So we were to take care of ourselves in a world that was dominated by men, and we needed to be smart, strong, and independent. In 10th grade, I was one of three African-American girls to integrate the white high school. And I do believe that is when I became passionate about advocating because it allowed me to know what was important and what wasn't. So with this mentality, after finishing this very tough decision in my life to integrate the high school, where there were many challenges, where I was always having to defend who I was and my color. So I decided to attend an HBCU for undergraduate. I went to Albany State University in Albany, Georgia. And when I finish my undergraduate degree, I didn't go to graduate school right away, but eventually I did seek a master's of public administration from Tulane University. I am a mother of two adult children and five grandchildren. I am very passionate and a servant leader advocating on behalf of Black women and girls. 
I grew up in a family where we were to give back. So I have been giving back the majority of my life. And I believe that every little bit helped. And it is important to understand how instrumental it is to be able to give something back to show and help others along the way. Well, thank you. Uh, that's a great backdrop. So you went to an HBCU in Albany, Georgia. Is that also where you integrated the high school? Was that in- No, I integrated the high school in my small hometown of West Point, Georgia. And your experience extended into Louisiana. And the significance of that for me is that all of your academic experiences when you essentially come of age in high school and beyond was in the segregated South. Then you went on to take up work, professional work in the South as well. You married, raised children in Atlanta, Georgia, as I understand it. And so you really are a child of the South. I am. <laughs> I lived in three states over my lifetime, Georgia, Florida, and Louisiana. So fast forwarding, when did you take on the mantle of civic leadership? I mean, what marked either organization, event, activity do you associate yourself with when you took on a leadership role in the larger community? Well, I started out locally. I became involved in this organization called Blacks in Government, BIG. I don't know if um, you are familiar with it, but that was an organization that I became involved in Louisiana. I worked for the state of Louisiana and got involved. And from that point on, I realized how important it is to have a voice and be at the table where decisions are being made that impact black people in general, but more importantly, black women. So I started with this organization called BIG and then I got more involved with my sorority and you're familiar with sorority, that's where a lot of community service is done in the community as well. And from there on, I've been very passionate about keeping and staying engaged and involved. I remember when I returned back to Atlanta, Georgia, I was looking at the news one evening and I saw this little petite lady on the news advocating on behalf of affordable housing for police officers, teachers, firemen, those first responders. And her name was Hattie Dorsey. She was one of the instrumental leaders in the National Coalition of 100 Black Women. That was the first time I heard about the 100 Black Women and that was in the late 80s. So I wanted to get to know this lady, this little lady with this huge voice. And I called friends and they introduced me to Hattie Dorsey. And I mentioned to her that I was interested in advocating on behalf of Black women and girls and wanted to know more about the organization. And I will never forget what she said to me. We are always looking for the right members for this organization. You just can't walk in because you think so. You got to show me that you want to be involved. So I spent a year attending things with her, getting to know her. And she sponsored me into the National Coalition of 100 Black Women in 1991. And she set the path and tone for me. And as you know, she was the third national president of the 100 Black Women. And what a great segue, because now we're, what, 30 years, 30 plus years down the road, you've become the national president of the National Coalition of 100 Black Women. So you not only talk the talk, but you walk the walk and stayed the course. So tell us a little bit about the National Coalition of 100 Black Women right now in the 21st century and the activism in the context of the agenda that NCBW has taken on in the year 2020. We have an extremely great public policy national committee, and they decided this year we would not have boots on the ground in D.C., but we would have boots on the ground in all 61 chapters across the country doing the same thing. So in line with Women History Month and their theme, we also have a theme, which is Census 2020, Reclaiming Our Voice Through Our Votes. We know how pivotal year 2020 is for Black America. What we have done thus far is that we have taken a look at the six states that was having problems suppressing voting. We decided that instead of going to D.C., we would do things on the ground this year. So, so far, we have made phone calls 
in the state of North Carolina, Georgia, and Phoenix. We have made over 7,000 calls to citizens in those states asking them to number one, vote, but also make sure that they complete the census information as well. And simply put, this is paramount important to ensure that our communities are fully counted in the census and that we elect a president with policies that align with NCBW mission and goals. Talk a little bit about NCBW's mission and goals. We are an advocacy organization. As you mentioned, we are embarked upon 39 years. We advocate on behalf of Black women and girls in the areas of health, education, economic empowerment. And we make sure that policy changes are important in those areas that will change the lives of the women and girls we serve in our communities in 27 states, District of Columbus through our city. And so I am reminded, Dee, about how we started. In CBW, Genesis was a small group of women meeting in each other's homes in New York City. And the goal at the same time was to represent Black women. That was in the 70s. The organization chose to become national in 1981 and have been very relevant since that time. We know that there still is a lot of things that need to happen, but our mission continue to be to advocate on behalf of Black women and girls, to promote leadership development and gender equity in the areas of health, education, and economic empowerment. NCBW was created to serve as the eyes, the ears, and the voice for Black women. And we have always strived to be a collective voice for women exercising a national voice on current issues that impact women. What are the current issues that your, your chapters are tackling in the area of health, education, and economic empowerment? We are staying focused on those areas in health that impact the Black communities. We make sure that we're providing opportunities, awareness, for those members in those communities that are uninsured, underinsured. We make sure that we're providing workshops and awareness on how to stay healthy. We have an initiative, Family Obesity, where we are training members of families how to read labels and how to keep themselves healthy. We've added mental health to our health initiative because we see that that is very important in 2020 and helping families stay healthy and mentally sane through all of the things that are happening in their lives. Education, continue to be mentoring. That's been one of our long-term goals. We have added STEMS, where we are teaching the young people in our mentoring program about STEM, science, technology, engineering, math. And we added arts to that theme this year. So it is now, instead of STEM, it is STEAM. We want to be sure that we continue to keep the children in our mentoring program, which are inner city children, abreast and, and keeping them relevant in the things that, that we feel important for them to need to know. Our economic empowerment has been one of those initiatives that you started as a national president. At the time, it was uh, my sister's keeper. We lost the name of that component to another organization because we failed to trademark it. So we changed the name in 2019 to Systemomics, but the concept is still the same, teaching women how to become self-sufficient in their lives financially and otherwise. Well, that's a great segue to a question that I woke up with this morning, which is what advice or instruction would you push out to the listeners in general, to your chapter members that will hear this interview on achieving some type of financial state of mind in the face of the coronavirus and women being fearful of the loss of jobs in their home, whether it's their job, their husband's job, adult children losing their jobs. What kind of things or resources would you like to share possibly as strategies for helping women to just hold on to their mental health right now on both the health front with coronavirus impacting us in terms of the physical body, but also mentally weighing on us because of the economic downturn that they're talking about 
this has been a tremendous impact on this country and globally. And I know that it is, I would advise them to seek information through their city, local government, counties, and state. I do know that the federal government is putting some stimulus packages in place now, and they are going to be trickling those down to local, state, and, and county government. Check in the local churches in the communities to see what kind of resources they have available for communities that can receive resources through them. And a check with your local banks to see if there may be stimulus packages that may be of assistance to you as a member of that banking institution. It is very difficult to understand uh, some of the things that are in place, but it is my understanding and my hope that the packages that are being put together by the federal government, it is going to take care of those people who are the least among us and not just the 100% those people in the big business industries. Can you think of examples that you've seen maybe there locally in Atlanta or heard about through your other chapters of things that faith-based organizations, churches are doing in the wake of coronavirus or things that banks might be doing or that one might ask their bank to do even if the bank hasn't thought to do it on their own? The one thing that I have heard of some of the larger churches in the Atlanta community are providing food for those children that are out of school that was receiving free meals at school. They are providing the opportunity for meals to be picked up. And this is going to be consistent for a while. And I think that these things are being shared in the news media. A lot of other churches will be doing the same thing. I heard this morning that there are churches across the state that are providing daycare for first responders, those people that must go to work, police officers, hospital workers, even some teachers in certain areas of this country, a local banker, because they have resources as well. And if we don't ask, we will never know. And sometimes it's just a small loan that they may be able to give to someone who desperately need it without having to go through all of those credit requirements that is normal during a normal period and cycle. That's a good point because What I'm hearing you saying is just based on the fact that you may have a long-term banking relationship with a bank, go in and ask, can you do this for me? They may be able to do it even though they hadn't thought of it and what is there to lose by asking? Bankers are going to be part of that industry that is going to be receiving some federal dollars to make those kinds of small business loans available to small businesses in the communities as well as members of the community that may have lost their jobs. I'd like to circle back to your sharing of your journey with going to an HBCU, a historically black college or university, and then going on to Tulane. But I know that in the context of your HBCU, you have been very invested for decades in giving back to your college, to Albany State, and you've served in many roles there. Can you talk a little bit about the duty or obligation of those, particularly those women who may be listening, who have graduated from HBCUs and ways in which they may not have even thought about how they can give back to their HBCU to ensure that the college continues to serve underserved minorities as being an institution that can survive and thrive. I served as chair of the Albany State University trustee board for 12 years. What I found is that there are many graduates at HBCUs that have a problem with something that may have happened with a faculty member, and they choose not to give back. What I do know is that it is such a small percentage of graduates from HBCUs that give back to the university. But I remember working with young people who graduated from BC schools, the big schools, ACC schools. And I remember a lot of these individuals made a monthly savings account with their employers, where employers were matching what they were saving. I honestly have to say, that's how I learned how to give back. I am sure that I would have figured it out, but I found out that that was the best way to do it through a savings plan that was matched by the United Way back in the 80s. I'm not sure if they're doing those kinds of things now, but I encourage anyone who graduated from an HBCU to find ways to give back because the need is so tremendous. And my reason for saying that is that state 
HBCUs do not get the same kind of budget money that the majority schools get. So we have to supplement certain things within the HBCUs that are not part of the budget. I do know in the state of Georgia, state of Mississippi, the alumni associations have sued the state to make the budget equitable in those states. Those things are still on the court books. They've not been resolved. But this is what we've had to resort to. So the giving back is extremely important because it subsidizes what they're not receiving through state budgets. I know that so many uh, parents of our generation had the benefit of an HBCU education, which proved to be a great education because they've gone on to be great professionals such as yourself. Fast forwarding in the 21st century where educational opportunities and choices are wide open, what do you see as the relevance of HBCUs continuing to function as a historically black college or university for children that are African-American? Is there still relevance today? What do those HBCUs offer that you would applaud? Well, I, I think that it is still significant today what I found, the nurturing, the individual personal contact. You're just not a number or a school number. They know you by name. They can assist you with so many other things as well. So I think that they are relevant today just as well because everybody is not going to be accepted into a majority school. We know that. But they have the potential of getting a quality education to become a professional. So our schools are still needing to be there for those people that are not going to be able to get accepted into the majority schools. Are HBCUs attracting students who could, who have a choice? They mean they can get accepted into a majority school. Can HBCUs uh, still offer a quality education? Yes, they can, and they are. And if you look at the graduation rate, you know, students are graduating at a very high percentage in this last decade than ever before. If you look at the graduation rate compared to, I can only use Georgia because I keep up with it more so than I do other states. The graduation rate is in a high percentile, the same as Georgia Tech. University of Georgia, Albany State is number three in the state of Georgia out of 12 schools. So to me, that says a lot about the education component that they're doing. They have some of the brightest professors at these universities that are doing extremely well. That could be other places, but they choose to be at an HBCU. And the research that they're doing today versus decades ago is very important and very relevant. I'd like to have you share a little bit about your professional journey, your climb uh, once you came out of Tulane, returned to Georgia, where you started and where you ended up. Well, very interesting because I was able to get a master's degree through my employer at the time through a weekend executive public administration program. I think that I probably focus on my education at the HBCU more so than Tulane because Tulane was a large university, but they did not know me by name. They knew me as a graduate student, weekend graduate program, and I worked extremely hard to be able to graduate from the program. But I do know that when there is a call upon graduates to come back and do a press release or a PSA about the school, we have so many graduates from HBCUs that do so well that they call back to be the spokesperson, to go out and do recruiting. And we are part of that element that are recruiting some of the best and brightest students across this country to come back and be a part of our school. And we are providing scholarship so that these students can have the same opportunity to attend an HBCU versus having to worry about financial resources. Well, sharing your passion for the mission of NCBW, where we are dedicated as members to breaking down the barriers found around gender and racial equity, I'd like to talk a little bit about gender equity and with specificity, your employment in the Atlanta metropolitan area. You were with Gwinnett County government, as I recall. Yes. And, okay. And what year did you start there? And what was that experience being a woman in an executive role over those years? Well, when I uh, 
returned to Georgia, I was working for the State Department of Audits, and I was on the road quite a bit. And with two small children and a husband at home, I needed to find some stabilization in my life. So I applied for a job. The job I applied for, I did not get it. But because of the young lady who interviewed me saw something in my experience and qualification that she thought would be significant for Gwinnett County, she offered me a different role. And it was not a bad role. It wasn't what I wanted, but it was an opportunity to be stationary. So I accepted the role. And once accepting it, I worked extremely hard to elevate myself so that people could know that I was going to do a good job regardless. I was promoted to lead the county's major project at transitioning all of government into a financial system. That was truly not my background, but my boss saw after they recruited from across the country and they couldn't find the right person, they offered me the job. So I was part of the project that transformed Gwinnett County from all of these little individual financial system to a major financial system that was very successful that uh, the counties started coming to take a look at our system to see how we implemented it and how we were able to keep it successful. And from that role, I was offered the position as county auditor, which is keeping all of the elected officers, constitutional officers safe and out of harm's way by providing audits of their departments, instructions on how not to do things that would create legal complications for the county, but also from them. I did that for 12 years. I kept the county out of trouble, legal trouble, helped the county get a AAA rating, and I'm very proud of what I was able to do. There was not many top Black executives in the county. i pleased to say that I was one of the top three. And just out of curiosity, and had any other women served in that position before you? Had any other African Americans served in that position before you? No, white males held the position prior to me. So you were the first woman and the first African American to hold the position of county auditor. Yes, in Gwinnett County. In exactly. Gwinnett County. Well, mm-hmm. congratulations. I, I think in all of the counties in the Georgia region, I was the only black county auditor. The others were white males and there was one white female. In bringing this interview to a close, can you share any pieces of advice for younger African-American women still in the workplace? And younger, not meaning just really young, but even those that are mid-career, but are aspiring to get to a position such as a professional standing such as that that you held. What advice would you give them? What survival strategies did you have to bring to bear in order to stay the course and to break through those barriers and becoming a breakthrough woman? It it may not be as relevant today as it was doing, but I was always the first in the office, the last to leave. I kept my eye on things. I made sure that I treated the employees with the utmost respect because I remember the a young lady who hired me eventually became the county manager and the county chair commissioner, and she had been very generous to me. I hired a lot of professional people who worked for me. I was not afraid to give young professional a chance because they were smart and they helped me to get the work done and it made all of us look good. So I was never afraid of that. But I always made sure that I took care of them by allowing them to be the one to take the holidays off to be home with their children because they worked really hard. That is the kind of nurturing I received from my boss early on. So I did not have any trouble giving that back to the people who worked for me. Because at the end of the day, being county auditor was not easy. It was very challenging because some of the constitutional officers were always uh, challenging what we had to do and say. But what they needed to know is that we were good at what we were doing. We had a smart team of young people working to make sure that the work we put out could not be challenged and could not be tested. I would just say to young people today, stay the course. Make sure that you pick and choose what you want to complain about, that you don't let everything be your fight, but you make sure that you know what's going on around you, you know who you're working for, And make sure 
that you're not always the first to leave and the last to show up. I always close an interview with requesting sage advice from those of us that have been in the workplace a long time. And you just gave four great nuggets. You just shared four great nuggets that I think can benefit women and younger professionals that are male that are in the workplace, because all of those sound like great ingredients for successful transition or progression in career opportunities and career advancement. So I want to thank you on behalf of Trailblazers Impact, myself and my co-host, Nan McKay, for sharing with us today your background, your advocacy agenda, your various forms of leadership roles in the larger community, and your just willingness to have stepped up to become a civic leader. Is there any one last piece of advice or thought that you would like to share with the listening audience, which I'm sure will include your membership, uh, as well as other women around the country? I just want to remind the audience how important the 2020 census and the 2020 presidential election is, the impact that it can have on this country, on African American. So I just want each of us to understand the importance of continuing to express that concern, help get people out to vote, help get people to fill out the census surveys so that we can make sure that we are all counted and this is going to be a, a socioeconomic impact in our country for years to come. Well, again, thank you so very much. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. We hope you're inspired to tell everyone about our podcast. Support our podcast by subscribing and shopping on our website, trailblazersimpact.com. And remember, you must learn a new way to think before you can master a new way to be.